Welcome, Kathy. Oh, gosh. Well, today we're going to talk about shade gardening, which is something that people were telling me, I only have sun. So there are lots of things that you can do to give yourself shade in little places. You can maybe limb up some shrubs. You could plant spring ephemerals underneath them. You can do all sorts of things to get a little more shade in your yard. And then there are the other people that are going, I have so much shade, I need more sun. Nobody has it all. <laughs> so today we will see if we can talk a little bit about shade. Let's see, aha. So, I used to teach special ed kindergarten children. You're all grown-ups. I can read this if you want, or you can be grown-ups and read it yourself. Um, so just to know that there's different part, types of shade. There's full shade, which there's always a little bit of sun that creeps through, because if you don't have sun, you can't have plants. And then there's partial shade, which is the perfect combination. Just a little bit of dappled shade where you can grow all sorts of nifty things. Okay. How much shade do you have? So everyone knows full sun is six hours or more. And if I'm in front of you, just let me know. I'll try to move around. Um, Full shade is less than one and a half hours of sun. So there's always a little bit of sun involved unless you're in the deep, dank forest. And because you live in a house, there has to be some sun somewhere. And again, afternoon sun is stronger than morning sun. So when you're out there in the morning, it's not that bad. And they say the time that you shouldn't go out in the sun, 10 to 2, that's when things start to get stronger. So everyone just, OK, how about that one? If you really need help, <laughs> there are sun calculators. I know, that sounds really silly, because you go out into your yard and you go, oh, it's sunny out. And other times you go, gosh, it's shady. I think you can figure it out. But if you need to have precisely what it is, they have a gimmick. I mean, they have a tool for you. <laughs> now, we've all noticed in the past few days or weeks that the sun is out longer. We've all just gone through the time change and messed up all of our old rhythms. We will now see the sun coming up over here and going up high in the sky and landing all the way on the other, almost in your peripheral vision if you were heading due south, as opposed to in the winter where it just goes like this. So all sorts of good things. Oops, wrong way. Now, when you have shade, just as if you were to have sun, which is which and why? <coughs> so, dry shade, tree roots. Has anyone tried to garden under the fibrous root system of a maple? Not good. It sucks all of the water out. Um, upland sites and sandy soils, you down here you wouldn't know anything about sandy soils, would you? <laughs> I didn't think so. So, as opposed to damp shade, near all the little kettles that there are on the Cape, uh, drainage issues from water runoff. And we don't really have any problems with clay down here, but um, drainage issues when we've been having rain, as we have quite a bit, that might be a little bit too much coming off 
of your roof from a driveway so it would be heavy, wet rain. So what if you do? What should you do? Always amend the soil. My son just bought a house down here in Bourne and he said, Mom, what do I do? And I went into his front yard. I went down below the topsoil and it was white. <laughs> and I said, you need compost. You need lots of compost. Compost is almost like the panacea for your soil. It makes sandy soil retain water. It makes clay soil lighter and fluffier. So, and it also gives you a little bit of nutrients. So compost is always good. Compost is always decomposing, thus it is compost. So adding that yearly, every other year, is always good for the soil. There's also that right plant, right place type of thing. Know what happens in your yard. I have what the west side of my yard that is full sun, whereas the east side of my yard is all shade. I live in an old farmhouse, so I have apple trees on this side, and then I have ferns over here. Do what you need to do for your yard and know your yard. That's where that little sun meter comes in. Now photosynthesis, why do we need this? Plants need a little bit of sun. So if you have a place that never, ever, ever gets sun, plants will not live there. So photosynthesis is the process that plants use the sunlight, the chlorophyll in all uh, the water and carbon dioxide to create a simple sugar to feed them. Nothing else can do it but plants. They make their own food. And the byproduct is pretty nifty. It's oxygen. <coughs> so here again, without adequate light, the carbohydrates cannot be manufactured and the plant dies. How do plants adapt to, sh to shade? Generally plants that have big, flat, leaves are there to take up an awful lot of sunlight. So think of hostas. Think of things like hydrangeas with their big, flat, thin leaves, as opposed to plants like lamb's ears or catmint. They're smaller, they're fuzzier, and those hairs actually shade out the leaves. So there are built-in mechanisms for the plants. Now we're getting to the fun stuff. You got through the science-y type stuff. This is the much prettier stuff. So the spring ephemerals. Now, if you have those shrubs that you have limbed up because you don't have that much shade in your yard. You can plant the spring ephemerals underneath those shrubs. So here we have little things like the phlox, the ferns, the trilliums. Trilliums. They are just lovely. The big huge grandiflorums and then the red erectums. And every time you see that little N in parentheses, that means it's a native plant. the painted trillium, and then the large yellow trillium, trillium luteum. These are plants that come up early in the spring and then go away. This is a little piece of heaven. These little heptacodiums, little <coughs> tiny, every place on earth has their little heptacodiums. We have these gorgeous little ones here. And the trout lilies. Does anyone grow these? They are a nifty plant. If you ever have an opportunity to go up to, I know this sounds strange, but up to the Mount Auburn Cemetery, mm -hmm. in the springtime, they have beautiful things to look at. 
the flowers on the shrubs are coming in, the, the flowering trees, and they have clumps of trout li lilies, the erythroniums. If you buy these, you get them in the fall. They're bulbs that need to be planted immediately. They come up and have these nifty mottled leaves in the springtime, and they're just lovely. Yes? So don't all those that you just showed us need a certain kind of soil? Like it needs very... to be very, very um, humus-rich soil. Yeah, but it can't be acidy like we have here, right? You, you could, yeah, they do need a little bit more of a neutral. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you could add a little lime to the soil, maybe? No? Pretty tricky down here. Ah. Okay, so still they would do well in that humusy, rich leaf litter type of soil that would work. Also, any time that you put compost on the, to the soil, you're actually you're not raising it terribly more towards neutral, but it is adding a little teeny bit. So if you were to put that in a lot of compost, that would help it. I wouldn't say plant these under rhododendrons and hollies and things like that, but under amelanchias, under shadblow, under lilacs, under things like that, that would probably do well, whereas you're already having those hopefully in a little bit more of a neutral soil than you would be having any of those ericaceous types of plants. But you're correct, yes. Compost is the decomposition of plant material, so if things are breaking down, yes, it's compost. Um, you can also use compost as mulch, and this is where people go, oh, whoa. Well, mulch can be anything from compost to rocks to glass beads, because all mulch is doing is keeping um, moisture in, it's shading the roots, and it's suppressing weeds. That's all that mulch does, and it could be anything. So you add what you think would be good. And I'm not going to even get into Asian jumping worms. Uh, <sighs> worm casting. <laughs> but worm castings from Asian jumping worms look very different from worm castings right. from night crawlers. Or if you're doing vermicomposting. Boy, are we off topic. <laughs> now, should you have a lot of organic matter compost in your soil, that would be great, especially here with your sandy, acidic soil. So yes. Thank you. Virginia bluebells. I had a friend of mine um, give me some of these. She goes, here's a little tiny pot. I want you to grow this. And I went, OK. And this was many, many years ago. I planted it. And it went away. This was like 40 years ago. And I went, oh my goodness, I killed it. That's what an ephemeral is. It looks like it has died completely to the ground. I now have a lovely patch of it, and I sell it at my garden club plant sale. <laughs> and they all buy it. <laughs> and they buy it. So bloodroot, which is another native, which is a lovely native, but it is poisonous. Know that that sap that they have that is red from the root, should you break it, um, is not good to get on any mucous membrane that you have, your nose, your mouth, your eyes, because it is a nasty thing. Does it mean you shouldn't grow this? No, you should know it and understand that you need to wash your hands or clean off your gloves after you have it. But this is an absolutely beautiful flower that comes and it's pure white and it looks wonderful and it's early in the spring and you're desperate for something growing out there and the flower comes up and it lasts for about three days <laughs> and then it flutters away and then you're left with some really nifty leaves these sort of kidney shaped things but it's really rather nice so apparently my clicker isn't working but right here is the seed pod for it. The flower comes up inside the leaf. 
comes out, has the seed pod, the leaf then grows out. So all sorts of nifty things. And that will just spread the little seeds all over the place. A rue anemone. Now, unlike other thelectrums that are nice and big and tall, this is a tiny one. And it comes up early in the spring and is lovely. Most of the tall other uh, thelectrum, they come out later in the summer. And twin leaf. I have this just because it looked really nifty. Um, and it was named after Thomas Jefferson. So it does have these two leaves that look almost like a butterfly. And you've noticed that in the springtime, an awful lot of plants have these white flowers. Um, so again, the poll early pollinators really love that. Now we'll get into plants that are more that you're used to. Now I think this next one is a repeat. Nope, it's a different one. It's a wood anemone. Um, this one, if you have any of those areas along the edges of the woods, this is a very nice ground cover. It has that deeply cut leaf and those little white flowers that when it comes up in April, uh, you just look at it and go, it's really spring. It is here. It's going to be so nice. <coughs> helibores. Everybody loves helibores. Now, there are two different types of helibores. So there's Helaborus orientalis, which are the ones that are blooming right now. And there's Helaborus niger, which are the ones that bloom from November till about January. So you could technically have flowers 12 years 12 months out of the year. Um, and I think they're pretty nifty. They also make really nice, long lasting cut flowers. Not that you could be growing, you know, acres of helibores out there, but they are rather nifty. Now, the actual flowers are right along here. What these are these colorful parts. Those are actually a combination of a uh, type of uh, sepal. They're called tepals, or do I have that backwards? Do you know when you see a, a rose and it has those green things around it that protect it? Those are modified ones, and that's the reason why the initial ones were all ones that hung down, because they come out so early, the rain and the snow fall off them. Underneath would be the flowers. Now you'll notice that in a few weeks, you're going to see the pods, the seed pods, come out from them. The tepals will stay, but they'll sort of change color and get a little bit muddy. So you can grow more of them by letting it go to seed. You also know that when you see them starting to come up, like right about now, you might be a little bit early, you cut off the old leaves to let all of the um, new ones come up. And you don't put those leaves into the compost pile if you see any browns or grays on the leaves, because that is a little bit of um, a bacteria that they have on them, so they put that in the rubbish, not in the epimediums. Do you grow epimediums down here? Lots of nifty epimediums. They are a slow growing ground cover that is one of the few things that will compete with the fibrous root system of a Norway maple. Now, there are a bunch of different types. The one over in the corner is pink champagne. Uh, the one over in the top right is uh, orange queen. But you have things like, at the bottom right, the sulfurium, which is a straight species. And then the one in the center, which is rubrum. So epimedium rubrum and epimedium sulfurium those straight species will grow a little bit faster and more vigorously, but they're not 
anything that's going to take over your whole garden at all. So if you're not growing them underneath the fibrous root system of a maple tree, they will grow a little bit bigger. Where did I get most of mine? From a plant sale. <laughs> you seeing a pattern here? Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> Far away in a distant land. <laughs> Lungwort, this is a nifty one. Not only does it have a pretty flower, but it also has the mottled uh, foliage. And um, you'll notice that there are some blue and that there are some pink flowers, especially on the one over on the left, which is Mrs. Moon. That's because once they're pollinated, the flowers change color to let the bees know the work here is done. And the one on the right, is a raspberry splash, and that still does it, but it, on Mrs. Moon, it's more dramatic. Woodland peonies, does anyone grow woodland peonies? Those are nifty. Um, if you go up to Bedrock Gardens in New Hampshire, just over the Massachusetts border, they have a whole stand of woodland peonies, and they have these big, white, single flowers that the pollinators abs absolutely love. They are not a native flower. Um, but what's really nifty about these, after the flowers go by, they're seed pods. The pollinated pods, uh, pollinated seeds are blue, and the unfertilized ones, unpollinated ones, are red. So you get this interesting feature in the, the autumn. Foam flowers, they're just so nice. They make a nice little carpet on the woodland's edge. Not only do you get these pretty fairy wands of flowers, but you also get a really interesting cut leaf to them. And those are another teeny tiny, only about six inch tall plants. Mary Bells, has anybody been up to Oh, the first landscape designer, um, Olmsted, Olmsted's place in Cambridge. Out in front of his house, he has a large tree and underneath it, almost uh, as a courtyard circular drive type place, he has hundreds of these Mary Bells. These are a native, interesting, it took a while for them to grow on me. Um, and then because they were native, I liked them a little bit better. <laughs> but they're still sort of like a, a tulip that's sad. How tall do they grow? About, yeah, about 12, 18 inches. Geraniums. If there is one category of plant that everyone needs to have in their yard, it is the geranium, not the pelargoniums that you have in the red flower that, that are, have the red flowers and you put on a pot, um, but the true geraniums. So over on the left you have espresso. Um, the foliage is actually a chocolate color, and the flowers are a pale violet. Doesn't look that spectacular there, but in person, it's very, very nice. You have uh, geranium macrophylla, which at my house, in that far away and distant place, <laughs> not on the Cape, um, it's evergreen and it's fuzzy leaved and it smells really nice. It has little pink flowers, probably grows to maybe 12 inches. I have it growing along the foundation of my garage, uh, garage strip uh, that I didn't know what to do with, so I planted a dozen of them there, and then a walkway in my house. So it's sort of protected. Okay, the faraway land is Attleboro. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, they stayed evergreen. <laughs> The last one is geranium phaeum, and this one is samovar, and this one really does need shade. Um, it has flowers in May, but you get that interesting design on the foliage. So that along with what, bibico, bibico 
and uh, geranium roseanne, those are ones for the sun, a great group of plants. And this will brighten up a shady area with the um, Brunera. The one in the center is Jack Frost. It has these forget-me-not like flowers early in the spring. Then it has this interesting sort of delicate tracery of white. Uh, there's another one that's called Looking Glass that's almost all white that I don't really like because it's too much white. And then the one over on the end is called Alexander's Great. It is a big, huge, heart-shaped leaf, and it is a really nifty one. The one over on the left is um, the straight species. Still has those cute little forget-me-not like leaves, though. Um, the columbine. The columbine is a native plant. Um, this one, the Aquilegia canadensis. Hummingbirds also like this because of the tubular-shaped flowers. Bleeding hearts. Now you'll see the two different names up there. The taxonomists have been changing the names of everything that we learned. So uh, the reason why they're doing that is because now they will become DNA based as opposed to what, I don't know, whoever named them, Gregor Mendel or somebody named them. So these, as you all know, sorry, I keep jumping around. Um, they grow to um, almost shrub-like proportions. They're coming up now. They're those little reddish parts that are poking up. And then by the middle of the summer, there will be nothing there because they come up, they look wonderful, they're terrific, and then they go away. So plant something interesting next to them to take care of that nasty mess of foliage. Yeah, I think, are they easy to divide? Yes. Also, if you let them go to seed, I have lots of babies. And yes, I sell them at the Garden Club plant sale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the chair of the Garden Club plant uh, sale. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta do it. Fern leaf bleeding hearts, much smaller, last all year, at least the foliage does. And it's a pretty um, fern leaf, so it, it's lovely. Woodland flocks. Everyone needs another acre of land that is woodland to have some of these spread through it. Nice, pretty, light fragrance, absolutely lovely. And it spreads by underground runners. Rogersia. Did anybody see the film The Gardener about the Cabot, uh, Frank Cabot? If you have the opportunity, look, watch that. It's a documentary, and it's, uh, he was the gentleman, part of the Cabot family, uh, but he also is the person that founded the Garden Conservancy. And his yard, if you can call it that, his little estate up in Canada is stunning. In his damp garden near his tea house, they have the Rogersia. And if you look at the shape of the flower and you look at the stylized way that they have uh, the Japanese make clouds, the Rogersia has that same form of the flowers. So interesting. Rogersia esculifolia, just like horse chestnut leaves, big palmated leaves. Simisifuga. I know it's not called that anymore, <laughs> but great for a corner of the yard. Fairy wands this tall in the middle of the summer. It's just a striking plant. And the burnet um, is the deeper foliage. Ligularia dentata. It's that's another one that rolls off your tongue. So Ligularia dentata, the bottle rocket and the rocket can take deep, dark shade. They really don't like the sun. Their leaves wilt in it. Britt May Crawford or Desdemona, which is another one, they have that purple underneath their leaves that can take a little bit more sun, but still a great shade plant. 
and ferns. I love ferns. Maidenhair ferns, royal ferns. Um, not all of them are native up here. Japanese painted ferns. Lady ferns, male ferns, great. They do wonders. Some of them can spread a bit, but you can press them, you can put them in floral arrangements. I am not a flower arranger, I'm sorry. Um, but the things you can get from your yard are absolutely fantastic. And heucheras, heucheras come in every single color. You can put them in containers. You can put them, you can make little rows of them around uh, other gardens. So they're the edging plants for them. And you have things like butterscotch and wild berry and the old fashioned uh, purple palace. Almost every color you can think of. Hostas, I can't say enough about hostas. I have some, but then I also have deer. <laughs> so, what do I do? I have um, a lot of onion family plants around the edge. So I have alliums and I have chives. So I have regular chives, I have garlic chives, I have society chives. I have uh, allium millennium, which is the little itty bitty one in the chive family. I have allium schubertii. Does anybody grow allium schubertii? Oh, yeah. It is a nifty, if you're doing dried arrangements, it's the allium that looks like fireworks. And you dry it, and I spray paint it, and I put it in all sorts of crazy things. Nifty one. But that's a sun plant, sorry. Um, baby hostas. You can make them a focal point in your shade garden. Put them in a container, put that on a big rock or a nice little stand, and you have something to look at. Japanese anemone. Yes, it will spread, but it comes at a time in the shade garden where it is lovely. At least I think so. <laughs> So you have pink ones, you have Henri Joubert, which is the uh, white one, and then you have Curtain Call, which is the deep rose one. Tricertus, the toad lily. Little orchid-like flowers in the shade in August. That is a pretty one. They also have them with the um, lighter green edged ones, which is Autumn Glow. So all sorts of nifty. That is definitely not a native, sorry. Um, another one that's not a native, but its autumn foliage is fantastic. You get this deeply cut, almost palmated type leaf that turns this stunning reddish burgundy in the fall. And that's another low grower. Oops. Questions. I was doing this on a Zoom meeting, sorry. <laughs> um, Lakothaway. Great broadleafed evergreen native plant. The only thing is if you have children or dogs, don't grow it because it's very poisonous. Well, you can tell the children not to go near it. Uh, but again, it's another one of those things that you have to um, wash your hands after you have it. And the middle one is variegata, and the one on the right is rainbow. Um, they say that it is deer resistant, but I have it in a place in my yard where deer don't really go at all. In other areas of my yard, there are marauding herds going by, um, but you know. Truly, I see like 12 of them going on the outskirts, and I just go, oh, gee. It, it, it doesn't draw them in. Um, oak leaf hydrangea. Deer do like this, I know. Um, they bite off the ends, the little buds. But a great native, not to right here, but to the United States. Um, and its autumn foliage is spectacular. That burgundy is lovely. And it's, unless you get one of the cultivars, the straight species, 
is big. Um, the smooth hydrangea. So like Annabelle, another nice one for semi-shade. Do you love those in Ruffin? <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. I use a lot of fish line in places because the deer bump into the fish line and they go, something must be there. I can't see it. But then they go away. The mountain hydrangea, the hydrangea serrata. Now, in, out at Heritage Gardens, you have like all of the wonderful hydrangeas in the world mm -hmm. over there. So you already know all about these. Did somebody? OK. And clethra. Do you grow clethra? If you're ever driving around in late July, August, and you're going by a damp area, and the windows are down, and you go, what's that smell? It's clethra. And it is a fantastic plant for pollinators. There's one that's called 16 candles. There's one that's called, um, I think it's Einstein. And then there's another one that is sort of pink, not technically native, a cultivar. And that is called ruby spice and hummingbirds like it. When does it bloom again? Is it uh, July, August, and it doesn't mind damp. Now, I have witch hazel here. This is our native witch hazel, Hamamillus virginiana. It blooms in November. It also gets to be 35 feet high. It is an understory plant. Now, why do I show you this? Because we do have a native shrub. But this is the one we probably all know, which are the ones that bloom in February. Right. So these are not native, but they're really nifty. And the pollinators that come out early, or if like this year, it's been very, very warm, and the bees wake up and they go, I need something. <laughs> this would be there. So we have Firecracker, Angelina. There's the bright yellow one, which is Arnold Promise. There are so many different types that you can get. But you need to make sure because it happened to me. I ordered the plant from a nursery. It came. It was lovely. I planted it. And I didn't really pay attention to it for a couple of years. And then I realized just one branch was blooming in the spring. And I went, it was grafted to a vigorous rootstock, which was the native. So I have this wonderful native that blooms in November, and then one <laughs> branch that's Jelena. So if there's something that's really growing well, look to see if there's a graft union on it. The native one does look really good in November, but it's 35 feet high. Maples. Generally, these, the Japanese maples, like the blood good over there, or the uh, Issa Grissom, the paper bark maple, or the full moon maple over here, they need a little bit of protection. They don't, especially the thread leaves, they don't like full sun all the time. So they're a nice understory type of plant. Oh, you would pay attention to this next one. This is a nifty plant. It is one of those things that people say, isn't that a green blob? Well, maybe, yes, it's a green blob in the middle of the summer. But in the springtime, early springtime, like right about now, or in just a week or so, it's going to have these little yellow flowers. So it attracts the first pollinators. Then in the autumn, it has those red berries, which the birds like. But in between, it is the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly, which is that nifty one down there that has the big false eyes. So this is a host plant that is absolutely terrific. In all of the gardens that I do, 
where do you want me to get out of your way? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I always plant a couple of these. They are dioecious, which means that there's a male and a female plant. So you have to watch out for that. Just like the hollies are male and female. So, but what you do in the summertime is you look and see if there are any leaves that have curled up. Not curled up around, just curled up like a big U and hanging down. And inside would be the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar peeking out. Those big false eyes that you see are there to scare the birds into thinking they're snakes. <laughs> The birds aren't very bright sometimes, <laughs> but nifty plant. Amelanchias. These are the wonderful trees that we should have in our yard along the side of the road. They are not very tall. These are the ones that can be limbed up and you can grow other things underneath them. They're called shad blow because they bloom at the time that the shad fish are running in the streams and it turns a lovely color in the autumn. So these as opposed to the dreaded Bradford pears. Mountain laurel, beautiful flowers, early spring bloom. The deer really love it. Uh, but another nice plant. And the pagoda dogwood, they're changing, as I said before, all of the names are being changed. Beautiful tiered flowering, uh, just sort of like our native Cornus Florida, which is getting anthracnose all the time. This is one that is, has a similar habit, but there is nothing like the native dogwood the Cornus Florida that you would see in forests with that horizontal branching pattern. Hazelnut. Do you want to grow your own hazelnuts in your yard? You could grow these. They are fantastic. Interesting little leaves, great flowers, good nuts, and red buds. They are not native to right here, but they are native to this um, quadrant of the uh, quadrant of the United States. My husband, I'd been wanting a red bud for years. My husband went on a business trip down south, and he came back and he goes, Kathy, you have to see this tree. It's wonderful. I'm going to get one right now. And I went like, I have been trying to get you to get one for years. So there's the native species over there on the left. You have forest pansy, which needs more shade. You have uh, Appalachian red on the right. And then we have rising sun in the middle, what goes through the, the different flowers. Thank you, Thank you very much.